Hello everyone. Uh, there are four of you who have signed. I will wait for a few more minutes before I start. Few more minutes, okay, and then we start. Okay, so as people are still joining, I'm just going to recap from where we are um, and then what we're going to do today. What, what have we done so far? I think we know what a reference genome really is. Reference genome, what good, what good is it? We know that because compared to the reference, we're going to call how the rest of us vary. Even if the reference is not the ideal reference, it doesn't matter. We have a reference from which we all deviate. That's all we need to worry about at this point. There is nothing like a perfect reference. We know that. I am the best reference for my own genome. Okay. So you are the best reference for your own genome uh, by standing in the sunlight or something. If I'm getting some mutation, my own reference is the best reference because on on day one when I'm born, um, suppose that there, are, there are projects where people are taking the cord blood of a newly born and they're going to sequence the genome and keep it almost like, um, like a birth certificate or something. And then as the child grows, that will be the child's genome. So literally we, we could have 7 billion references for every individual. We are not there yet. So we are using either a combination of few people's genome as a reference or even a single person's genome as a reference. A G19, which is a human genome reference, which is very heavily annotated and used, is a genome of a single individual. They started with five of them, but then finally when they were cleaning up all the mutations, they used only one person genome to clean it up. Okay. So we don't, we don't care that person is related to us, where is he, whatever. But we know that we are all going to use that as a reference. So we will all be talking the same language. When I'm saying that at position number one million, at one position in chromosome one, there is a mutation, you know exactly which position I'm talking about. That is the value of the reference. So we have done that in the first uh, few classes. We have done... Why do we need reference genome? What are we going to do with the variation? So we are going to find variation among population, variation in disease versus normal, variation in, um, in virally infected plant versus non-virally infected plants, resistance versus non-resistance, all those things we can do when we have a reference. The second two or three lectures what we did was how do you even create a reference genome? What does it take? Where is the technology? How do we start? So we said that, you know, because there is next generation sequencing technology, we can really sequence the reference genome for every organism that we care. Okay, so we are now there. 
and we know how to find the variants. I am hoping in the hands-on classes, you've also learned a little bit more about what are the variants, how do we, how do we detect it and how is it the file looks like, how is the variant, um, like I'm varying from a reference at this position, how is it reported in a .vcf file. You know that, that gives you a much more comfort level as to what am I talking about when I'm talking about mutation, correct? So, sometimes a reference genome can have a mutation and I don't have a mutation. I am the legit person, but because the reference has, has a different allele there, whenever I'm going to compare mine, I'm going to show up as if I have a mutation there. It's not, I'm not mutated. The reference is mutated, but it doesn't matter. It does matter at the end. I will also end up this two lectures by saying that how can we correct for it? But let's start now with the mutational landscape. So what does mutational landscape mean? I'm going to switch to, I'm going to switch to the PowerPoint mode right now and go to the slide mode. So the next two lectures, like today and tomorrow at the same time at nine o'clock, we're going to talk about mutational landscape of a given organism. What does it mean? And what is it good for? Why do we have no mutational landscape of an organism? Okay. So that's what we're going to talk about. I'm going to switch to the next slide. Okay. So within, okay, we are all, we all have different genomes. There's no doubt about it. Okay. That's why 23andMe, with the companies who survive on individual genome and commercial aspect of the genome, they make money because we are all different. And we want to know how different they are, we are from others. And we want to know, do we carry any disease mutation in us? So these companies have a big business because our genomes are different. And hence we are called individuals. So this individual thing also comes in all insects, any, any species, if there is an individual animal, Within that species, we call them individuals, okay? Within a species, such as human, mouse, and yeast. Okay? And we are similar at more position than we are different because we haven't speciated yet. We are all human. Okay? So we are the same species. So at majority, even, even more, more than majority of the position, we are all similar. Okay? But we are different because of our very, our genomes vary enough to make us unique in terms of how we think, in terms of how we talk, height, weight, so many things that can be genetically related, that can also be um, environment and um, you know how we are nurtured. So a lot of our properties come from genetic variation and those will show up in our genome. Some are not genetic variation which won't show up in our genome, it will be epigenetic or it can be it can be anything else from the environment. So, when you talk about the mutations in a genome, there are only two kinds of kinds: germline, which you inherit from your parents; somatic, which you accumulate during the during your lifetime because you ate too, you drank too much coffee, or you smoked, or you sat in the sun for too long ultraviolet radiation, x-ray exposure, all those things can cause somatic variations which should be called variates. Okay, so when we talk about mutational landscape, we are always talking about only germline because somatic mutation, it's hard to imagine that somatic mutation will have a landscape in the sense that whatever somatic mutation I got is exactly what you got, it's less likely. And somatic also means tissue specific. Okay, so yeah, I, I may not even have a given muta somatic mutation in any other tissue other than my skin tissues. I may not even have some somatic mutation that's there anywhere other than my lung. So even somatic mutation varies within a person's cells. So that's a different thing. We're going to hammer a little bit on the germline mutation because that is what, um, as IBABNs, maybe others are also joining from outside, I don't know, but in IBAB, 
we are working on the mutation landscape uh, of some insects and other things. So it will be good to know what it really means and how we find out. So in the next slide, okay. So let's go back a little bit and see what does it mean, how, how, what percentage of the genomes we vary and individuals vary from the reference. It depends on when we speciated, how long ago we separated. In fact, humans probably are the most closely related to each other than any other animal. Okay, so unless we really killed many animals and species, you know, subspecies are gone or something. So let me go to variations among humans. So it's least variating, right? So there are, according to um, a thousand genome project, I'll tell you what that project is. According to thousand genome project, which is the underestimation, I think, because that in the thousand genome project we've only sequenced three thousand individuals and but we have selected them very strategically which i will show you in the next slide but there are 89 million positions where all the humanity uh, according to thousand genome vary meaning that uh, out of the three billion right in the human genome we have three billion positions out of that 89 million position Anyone can vary, okay? We all vary, like, but not one individual. One individual can usually varies only at three million positions compared to the reference. But since each individual is varying at different three million positions, it comes to 89 million. Are you getting it? So all of us vary from the reference three million positions, but some positions are the same. Like me and my siblings may vary at two million positions only um, because one million position we have the same. So when you intersect all of the thousand genome, okay, lot of them become common and few of them become unique. So the unique uh, 89 million positions we vary. You're getting it? So individual varies in three million position. The 3,000 individual they have sequenced, they all vary total at 89 million positions. How you can get these numbers using our bioinformatics tools will be kind of the end of this lecture. So you will know what I'm talking about here much more clearly, but just keep that in mind. Okay, 1,000 genome, let's go to 1,000 genome project. Okay, why did they do 1,000 genome? The very reason they did 1,000 genome project um, after the first human genome was assembled reference say G19 or whatever because they realized immediately that oh my god this may not be the real reference let's we unless we represent the at every three billion position unless the base is represented in majority of the people that cannot be a reference so there is one genome now but at each of the three billion positions you need to have a major allele means majority of the human being have a G in that position. Majority of the human being have a A in this position. Okay, and then from that, if you vary, then you have a mutation. Okay, so they said, okay, let's now select very strategically um, individuals from different ethnicity across the world. Okay, when they did that, across the world, how did they take it? This you can, when you go to the 1000 Genome Project uh, on the website, you will see many more beautiful pictures. So they tried to diversify all the black dots are the places where they have at least taken 200 people, blood sample from 200 people. Okay, so, and then they have sequenced genome, exome, whatever they could sequence. This was done 10 years ago, so still the technology was kind of um, iffy, okay, but that is done. And so the India, let's see India, what did they do? India never gives samples to anybody, okay? <coughs> so what they did was they have taken Punjabis. Do you see a Punjabi here? Yeah? Hmm. You have a Punjab from Punjab, Gujarat, Sri Lanka, Telugu, and Bangladesh, okay? So they have taken five different ethnicity because India doesn't export samples, it doesn't allow other countries to take the sample. They had to go for people who have migrated from India to other places to collect the samples. That is how they included India in that. 
which is a great thing. I am really, really happy that they did that in a very sensible way. And then from China, they have taken five different ethnicity from Africa, from Europe, from South America. Of course, they didn't take anything from America because America is not a representation. Uh, it's true ethnicity. It's all Europeans only moved here, right? Except some native Indians and others from America. So it's kind of representation. So 3,000 people, 200 from each ethnicity, they've sequenced it. And now you compare it with AG-19. Now if we go back to that, that's when they're saying that, oh my God, all these ethnic people vary from AG-19 at 89 million positions. Okay, so that's what they know, how the human variation is. These are SNPs, okay. So, so that is a big database. We use it in IBAB. We have project going on with the 1000 genome. And we have even created a ethnically normalized human genome and we just published it in BMC Journal. So if, you, if anybody is interested in that, you can see it. Okay. Uh, so that's what we're going to be using in future um, at our institute at least so that we can have others use that because um, that helps us redu reduce um, false positive and everything in the variant column. Okay. That I, I'll tell you in a little bit. Okay, so you know where the, how the individuals can vary now. Okay, the whole um, um, emphasis in this, uh, in this lecture is to understand the variation within individuals. In, if when you go to, um, when you go to um, insects and everything, they may vary geographically. They won't have ethnicity or anything, but they may vary, ge vary geographically. So which is the same thing. It's the same thing. The tools that you used for um, for identifying, is there a signature for Tamil Nadu people? Is there a signature for Bangladeshi? Is there a signature for Great Britain? Is there a signature for um, um, Chinese, Southern Chinese? So you can, you can do that if a large number of people from that area has been sequenced and compared to the rest of the, um, you know, rest of the population. Okay, so it, that, that's what we're trying to see whenever we're talking about germline mutation. Okay, germline mutation is also important. Let me see what I have. Okay, germline mutation is also important um, to subtract. When you're looking for somatic mutation, meaning that what is causing cancer? You take in a tissue and you sequence it. What is ca causing cancer? You're going to see both germline mutation and somatic mutation in the tissue when you do the variant call. Okay? So, what does it mean? So, when you're doing variant, you don't know what a germline mutation is. Germline mutations are there in every cell in your body because you have inherited it from your parents. Okay? So, every cell when you sequence, you can get germline mutation. But somatic mutations are limited to the tissue which got mutation. So you have to always subtract the mutations from a somatic cell, so it's a mutation, a germline mutation from the mutations in the somatic cell to find out what may be causing the disease. Okay, so the germline mutation and the thousand genome database and the 89 million SNP that is there in the thousand genome database, they all offer a good subtraction when you're looking for disease specific mutation. Your assumption, of course, is the 3000 genome that they have sequenced under the 1000 genome project, they're all normal. But none of us are normal. Correct? So, in any event, we're going to assume that all the mutation, the 89 million mutation that's reported in the 1000 genome are not from normal people because these are normal, they, they, they were normal when their genomes were sequenced, normal people, and hence, Anyway, all these variants cannot be disease, cannot be um, associated with any disease. So when you're sequencing one of my lung tissue, thinking that this man may have lung cancer, so I sequenced my lung genome and of course I have all my germline mutation and everything is sitting there. I have to subtract these 89 million mutations in the 1000 genome database and come to a smaller set and say, okay, now from this small set, one of them is causing the disease and which one that can be, right? 
So that probably I'm going to talk about the somatic, somatic mutation in cancer a little bit in the next lecture. But let's go back to the okay germline mutation. So one of the benefits of the germline mutation and this whole 89 million mutation that we got from 1000 Genome is it gives you a nice subtractive platform so that you can subtract all the false positive and come down with the disease causing mutation. What are the other benefits? Before we move on with that, let's see how, how many types of variants are we talking about here. We're talking about single nucleotide polymorphism, which are basically the big chunk of the variations in our genome. Then there are translocations, where translocations are one part of the uh, chromosome goes and attaches to the other part. If I recall, um, leukemia, I think, is caused by a translocation, where um, able, a BCR and ABLE, nine chromosome nine part of the chromosome nine goes and attaches to chromosome 14 and make a hybrid make a chimeric gene called bcr able okay and that bcr able is actually causes leukemia okay that's actually a biomarker for leukemia so that translocation and you already know probably down syndrome chromosome 21 three copies are made it becomes longer then that's uh, that causes down syndrome and retardation that's kind, those are kind of comes under the umbrella of translocation. Okay, so let me write down if you if you guys didn't hear me correct. Let me let me write down these things. Hold on one second. Yeah. So some examples are. You can read. In, I'm not going to tell too much about this thing because that's why I'm writing this in red now so you can you can search in Google and learn more about what BCR label is and then chromosome 21 right they're also called trisomy or something like that okay trisomy okay so this is for leukemia Okay, and this is for Down syndrome. Okay, things like that. So these are translocations. So they do cause disease. Of course, SNPs, there are many, which I'll come back to that in tomorrow's um, lecture when I'm talking about somatic SNP, somatic SNP mutation that have been used in disease to identify disease and to also give a proper treatment to cancer patient. I'll talk about that. Copy number variation. Copy number variations are HER2. Everybody probably in this class and uh, they know HER2, right? Because HER2 copy number variation is a classic signature for HER2 positive breast cancer. What, is, what does copy number variation mean? So the HER2 gene is copying several times. So suppose this is the genome and every, all of us have one HER2 gene here. In cancer, in, this happens somatically too. In cancer patient, the multiple copies of HER2 sitting next to each other. Four copies in one patient, six copies in another patient. What, what does it do? What does a copy can do really? It expresses heavily because any time uh, and there is an environmental pressure and there is a need for a particular gene to heavily express, okay, then it will copy itself many times and then it will go really express crazy and that is called HER2 positive, HER2 positive breast cancer. So the copy number variation is some kind of genetic marker, you can call it variant that varies from normal people. Of course, there are deletion of some chromosome, insertion of some chromosome. These things also happen. Inversion. Inversion, you have a big chromosome here and then going this way, right? Going this way and then you have a opposite strand going this way, right? This part of it 
will go and join here. Reverse complement of it. it. It just gets inverted. This goes here, this goes here. It gets inverted. This, this can happen. This happens a lot in other organisms. In human, it, we haven't evolved too far, so we don't see much inversion. Um, but it could, it could happen. It, the reason why we don't see so much inversion um, across the individuals in human is because we are not really um, de novo assembling everybody's individual genome. We are just saying how we vary from the reference and inversions are hard to find out using, um, using short read technology. So suppose if I take sequence my genome and I assemble it independent of the reference, I will see the inversion. Okay, in some places I may be inverted. So it is just that we are not doing that because our genomes are big and it's very expensive to sequence deep enough and assemble uh, everybody individual genome independently. Okay, that day is not too far though. So these are hard to find. So these are all the types of variants we're talking about when you're talking about mutation landscape. Okay, so going to the next slide. Where are we getting the germline mutation and where are we getting the somatic mutation? Okay, germline mutations are coming because two, individual, two individuals, parents, okay, they come together, sperm. So if mother is common, then all the mutation within the individuals will be coming from sperm. Okay. And in somatic mutation, nothing happens to a germline mutation. See, nothing happens to a germline mutation is perfect. So when I take the blood from a person, then most of the time, if it doesn't have leukemia or something, you will get all the germline mutation. You're guaranteed to get all the germline mutation. You may get more, but you will get germline mutation. But for somatic mutation, you do need tissue samples and that gets a little tricky. In Germline mutation, as I said in the first slide, what is it good for? I'm finding all the germline mutation. Okay, one of the biggest thing about germline mutation is that those things get solidified in our genomes by a phenomena called natural selection. So, if I'm in, I grew up in Bangladesh. Um, I'm born in Bangladesh and I grew up in Bangladesh. My generations grew up in Bangladesh. My grandfather grew up in Bangladesh. Our genomes adjust to, um, adjust to that environment and it gets some mutations are um, important. Some mutations gives you a selective advantage like you can survive in a humid climate, in a salty uh, salt water condition um, and whatever the environment condition is. Some mutations give you an advantage and that genome survives. So that is how we are going to differentiate within ethnic diversity. That's where it comes from in our genome. If that didn't happen, probably we will never be able to tell from our genome which ethnicity a person is coming from. We are hoping that there is enough selective pressure acted on individual people who grew up in Punjab, who grew up in Gujarat and then also in India especially because of the uh, endogamy, endogamy and consiguous marriage. Endogamy means you marry within a caste. That has been happening for 1500 years. Uh, the date of endogamy, um, the start of the practice of endogamy goes back to Gupta period. Okay, there are um, this, this paper where they found out the approximate time when the endogamy may have started in India is uh, is done by Partha Muzumdas lab. They have done a lot on uh, Indian population using microarrays and now they are doing of course using NGH technologies. So I'm going to write that person's name because it's Partha Muzumdar. Mutunda from, I think he is in Kalyani. Okay. In the Institute of, National Institute of Biomedical Research or something. Okay. So, NI, NIB, I always forget, Biomedical Research or something like that. Okay. So, there are a number of papers from that. And then the other papers for the Indian diaspora 
uh, where they have sequenced thing is Lalit Singh. Lalit Singh and Tyagarajan. Okay, they are from CN, uh, CSMB. CSMB Hyderabad. These two groups, these two groups have solidly contributed to our understanding of what's happening in India. How our gen genomes are varying and going. But still we have a long ways to go. But the method they have developed, the approach they have taken, those are all very important from um, in understanding population genetics of humans in general. Okay. So what happens in natural selection? So since we are going to focus on the germline for this lecture, let me go to natural selection. Okay, I'm just saying germline. Um, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to paste this link. Uh, paste this link on on the WhatsApp group chat. And let me see whether I can cut and paste it here. I should be able to paste it right on this um, chat box here. But I'll do it at the end, okay? I don't want to... Um, I don't want to disturb my setting here, okay? So, you go here, and this is a, a little bit older paper. It's a nature education. There is a journal like that, which I never knew until I ran into this. And they're talking about, how do you do this? How do you use the germline mutation to do population genetics? It's a very good, um, uh, very good uh, thing. So, I'm going to talk a little bit about that paper as well here, okay? So... Now you have germline and somatic. I'm comparing with somatic because because I think that way it's it's easier to appreciate the germline. What the germline mutation? It's a natural selection, right? So most of the homozygous mutation are from natural selection. What do I mean by homozygous mutation? Okay, I know I talked about this in the first few lectures. I showed you a graphic. I'm going to go repeat those graphics again so you can connect with my first lecture. Homozygous mutations are, it's a mutation in the sense that I am homozygous, it means that I have a G in both my chromosomal arms from which I, which I acquired from my mother and a father, mother and a father, and then, but it's not the same as in reference genome. So I have both of them a G and a reference of the A in that position. What happens in natural selection, suppose maybe if reference is the precursor of mine, just assume, and then <coughs> I, got, I got a G mutation randomly by sitting in the sun, or my grandfather got a G in that position sitting in the sun. Suddenly, my grandfather had an advantage over his neighbors and his progeny are surviving better because his progeny are surviving better down the generation. More likely that your mother and the father, both survivors, have a G in that position. So you become homozygous to G, which is alternate from the mutation that is there in the reference genome. You know. So natural selection, one way to come up, come to grips with now how natural selection might have change the human diaspora genetically is to look for homozygous mutation. These are also, I call it at least, homozygous alternate allele. It's alternate just because the reference genome doesn't have it. If my genome was a reference genome, it won't be an alternate allele. It will be just homozygous. Okay. And it will be in all cells because nature has selected it. Right. One of the biggest example of that is the sickle cell anemia. In, in Africa population, they were subject to malaria, okay, and they were subject to malaria, sickle cell anemia, okay, sickle cell anemia, it's a disease, it's a disease, but they got selected for this because if they had sickle cell anemia, where the red cells uh, become really distorted and um, become almost like a donut. What happens is they are protected from malaria. So between the two devils, malaria, die of malaria or 
we live a little compromised life with sickle cell anemia nature selected sickle cell anemia because otherwise malaria will, would have eradicated the whole population so that's what natu- natural selection means okay so it will be there in whole cell so you can detect them in the, from whole blood that means all you have to do is to draw blood from people and sequence it find the homozygous mutations and you have some angle on to how the environment might have selected yeah a selected mutation how we may have diverged because of environment okay and then there is drifting also genetic drifting so that's a different thing in somatic mutation however it's mostly going to be heterozygous meaning that one arm like if the sunshine and satin sunshine and i got a i got a mutation in my lung lung tissue then it's going to be in one arm it's less likely that both arm of my genome got simultaneously mutated at the same time at the same position is less likely so most of the somatic mutation would be heterozygous and you got to believe it the heterozygous mutations may carry the causative mutation causative mutation of course um if you marry within cousins which is called consanguous um then what can happen is if you're carrying a um breast cancer predisposition mutation and your cousin is also mat- carrying that mutation then you'll, you'll be homozygous to that mutation in a predisposition okay so it's not like it has to be heterozygous it can be homozygous okay only in somat this will be only in tissues in tissues tissue specifically i'll be focusing more on that tomorrow okay okay so let's talk about just snips because there is translocation there is that maybe we all have translocation that's also normal many translocation could be normal we don't know much about it now in human and even less in any other organism correct so we'll just focus on snips we have we have big snip database uh, for human and i'm just giving you an example of human because a lot more is known about it and we learned how to find snips um, from only human genome now we are applying to every other organism so whatever we learned is from human genome so far so human genome or i won't say just human genome drosophila and other model organisms okay so our mutation how do we how do we know a mutation is not because you you're going to sequence blood from a grown up man right grown up man grown up woman or something okay so any time you take blood samples from somebody it's always a mixture of mixture of somatic and germline mutation unless you got it from a really embryonic stage or a child who is just born and coming out so so the way we defined snps single nucleotide polymorphism within a species is by saying then it it be common to at least 1% of the population because any somatic mutation i got in my blood sample will not be there in other people it will be totally random so i'm saying that minimally 1% of the population 1% is a lot when you consider 7 billion people right now okay and it's also kind of iffy really iffy as to but you at least expect it to be in other people okay let's say that in a minimal way so that's the definition of snips if it is not satisfying that definition you can call them variants they call it snb if you ever wonder why they use snb single nucleotide variants this is not polymorphism and this polymorphism is the word that they use to say that okay across some population they all have this very small number of people but they have it so there is a subtle difference between snv and snp snv can become a snp if you find it in more and more population for example for example right now there are many many snps that are unknown okay we do, we don't call them snp because we haven't sequenced enough people from india it is so it's such a diverse population if you sequence a large number of people many of the snvs will turn into snps because now we'll see that oh my god this is common among punjabis also outside punjabi in this this variant is never seen okay 
So, so there is a little bit go back and forth between SNPs and SMB. Again, SNPs, as I told you, can be homozygous or heterozygous. Homozygous means both arms of your genome has a variant that's the same. Heterozygous means both arms have different A and a G and A and a T. And uh, in biology and in genetics and stuff, you must have read um, recessive, um, autodominant, autorecessive. I'm not going to go into those things. Those are all heterozygous mutations. You inherit a particular mutation from mother and the father. If it is the autodominant, then you will get the disease. Because you, even if you got it from mother alone, you will still get it because that arm is autodominant. That particular position is autodominant. Okay, but if you have auto recessive disease, then what it means is you got both arms of your mutation have that mutation that causes the disease. Because it is auto recessive, it will only happen when it is homozygous. So these are things you will know ahead of time by what disease mutation you are finding, so you know what to look for. Okay, one of the example I can give for auto recessive mutation is in a family in a consecutive uh, um, married family there were three siblings one of them had a neurodevelopmental disorder we sequenced mother father two siblings and the affected one okay since others don't have it and it is a genetic disorder you can almost assume that it's auto recessive and if you're unfortunate you got both arms and the mutation from both arms and you are getting the disease. Mother is heterozygous, father is heterozygous at the same position. Okay. And then other simply got heterozygous. Okay. Because they got the good portion from one of the one of the parents. But the person who is sick has both arms unfortunately coming with the one with the mutation. Okay. That we, we published that also, which is called Hayes one. If you look at IBAB paper and search for HES1, HES1 mutation. It's a gene, it's a mutation in a HES1 gene, which is a novel mutation. Nobody has associated that with uh, developmental disorder, but we found that. And that's how we found it. We knew that it has to be homozygous. That's another way to filter out the false positives. It has to be homozygous for the affected. It has to be heterozygous for everybody else. So if it is absent, then it, it can't be, it's not possible. They have, Everybody else is heterozygous in that family. Okay, so that's that's the beauty of it. So you, you need to know some information also to filter out the... So that's what I'm saying in, the, in these two things, right? Okay, so you get a feel for that. Okay, within a population, now I'm... It may seem like a little bit jump, okay? But I'm going to go there anyway because I think it you will you will be able to connect later. Later, suppose now because we are working with germline mutation and we are not into disease. I did talk about HES1, which is a disease thing. It's easy to get dragged into a disease thing whenever you are talking about SNPs because human disease is a very interesting thing and a lot of funding goes on there. But in the population thing, what do you, what do you question? What are the questions you are going to ask? Okay. Um. Insect or something that's growing in Bangalore or going in, um, uh, growing in um, Kanyakumari, how it is differs from somewhere in um, Tanjore, Tanjore district uh, in terms of environment. What kind of environmental adjustment they have made and how does the natural selection work between them? Okay, so what you're going to do again, like a thousand genome project I mentioned, you're going to take. You know, insects or flowers or plants from one region and you're going to take insects or flowers or plants from the other region and then you're going to genome sequence it and the assumption is you have a reference for that plant or animal or whatever you selected. So there is a reference genome and you selected many individuals from place A, many individuals from place B and you sequence them and you're asking what is it that distinguishes A from B? Is there a natural selection that made A a different, a different genome and what are the... Then you are typically looking for homozygous mutations because those are the natural selection. So by now, 
it should be really each etched in your head saying that whenever you're looking for natural selection that may have helped a adapt to condition condition of its area and b adapt to condition of a different area you are looking for a homozygous mutation that is differing in these two population correct yeah so there is a index called fixation index remember in three slides i had yeah in this slide i showed you a link you can read this this is beautiful okay they tell you how they did it you know it's a nine it's a 2008 paper 2008 paper and they had asked the same question how am i going to find out those sites where nature has selected to make a survive in this condition b survive in another condition okay so what they did was the fixation index is it gets fixed homozygous mutation means it gets fixed right may be may mean that both arms have the same g and it's happy and it's surviving so fst equal to ht minus hs by ht what does mean okay in the entire population in the entire population all, all insect that you sequence so far a given position if it is has exactly same g everywhere then the fixation index is zero okay if it has a g and a t then you asking whether g is in this population t is in that population or what is happening so ht is the head home ht is the what do they call it ht is a, represent the heterozygosity mean here the heterozygosity doesn't mean the two arms heterozygosity means across the across the population in that position is it a single base or more than one base so one of the classic example of this is is like a population that is segregating and they can breed each other breed within each other the next slide okay the classic example is squirrel which got separated by canyon and are unable to interbreed then one of the so one mutation made it suddenly that they can interbreed okay those mutation got selected for the different canyon condition let's say so one population has a c and the other population has a t okay other population so when they separated both of them had the same thing okay when they separated one got mutated and now it cannot interbreed with other okay so what is the fixation index do now fixation index is saying that i think with this example you will understand but across the population how many bases are there in that position there are only two bases right c and a t g and a they have not seen c and a t so that is 50% 50% of the allele frequency so the heterozygosity in all squirrel is 0.5 50% okay but when they look at one side of the canyon and the other side of the canyon in one side of the canyon it's always t in that position that means hs hs which is just for that population it is a zero because it's not varying so according to the formula it will be minus 5 uh, 0.5 minus 0 divided by 0.5 which is total population total population sub population this is total population this is a very useful small number called fixation index that can tell you how the population might have and we are using all the homozygous mutations only for this that's where the homozygous mutation comes in i'm going to take a little bit of um, poll here okay I'm starting the poll now. Okay, so uh, I hope you're getting it. 
okay we will we'll come back to this and do it again and again okay so when you are still answering the poll Okay, so I'm going to move on. You guys are hearing me, right? Hearing me and you're answering the poll. Did you see, are you seeing the poll? Okay. So I don't see any one of your answer on the on the poll. So I don't know whether you saw my poll or not. Um, but if you are seeing it or not seeing it, can somebody put in the chat if you're seeing the poll or not seeing the poll? We cannot see the poll. Okay, we not see the poll. Oh, okay, okay, got it, got it. Uh, that's that's my fault. I'm sorry. Hold on. Yeah, I have to switch to the camera mode uh, to see the poll. So you will see it, um, see it now, and then you can you can answer the poll. You're all typing one there. Now I see that, but I'm going to ask you a trick question, okay? So I will know really you got it or not, okay? So not in this, not in the next slide, but the slide after, I'm going to ask you what's happening, okay? So if you got it, I think you really got it. This is a little, really, really small gap. You don't want to leave in the concept level, okay? Because then it gets, it gets very iffy, especially because the reference genome are not perfect. Your interpretation will get screwed up, okay? So, okay, I'm going to go move on. I'm going to move out of this uh, poll screen. Everybody got the question, so you can keep answering. Um, even when you don't see the poll screen, I will get the answer. So you, as long as you got the answer, you're good. Okay, I move to the slide now. So I'm in the next slide. Okay, so homozygous you got. Now I'm going to tell you, what does it mean to have homozygous reference versus homozygous alternate allele okay so homozygous re reference is where my genome doesn't vary from the reference genome at both position that means I am so anywhere you are not calling variants at all every position in the genome when you're doing the variant calling which you might have done by now in your hands-on lectures correct if a position is not reported what it really means that I'm, I'm homozygous to the reference. That's what it means. Okay, so every position in the genome, there is a call. It's just not calling. It's not saying that, yeah, you are homozygous to the reference. When it's not saying that, that means you are homozygous to the reference. Okay, it's only going to report when you are varying from the reference. Either in one arm or both arm. Okay, so that is the point I want to make here. So the variant calling, the important thing is the variant calling program will be silent about this because it's not varying. So if you have three, 3 million position you are varying, that means 3 billion minus 3 million positions you are exactly what the reference genome is. Okay, that is why we are all human because we are not varying that much. Okay, so uh, 3 billion this many million and then 3 million. Okay, this is our genome size and this is the number of position we vary. So, 
we are wearing a 2997 million position we have reference homozygous reference allele that's what it is although we almost never talk about it and we ignore it that is the truth okay and in these 3 million positions it could be homozygous alternate or heterozygous alternate either you are wearing in one arm or you are wearing in two arms so now just to solidify you already said one one I am hammering at it just so you know what we are doing when you are wearing calling silent positions we are not varying okay so what does it mean it has implications I will tell you about it maybe not today uh, what time is it oh my god I am almost getting done with my time so wearing calling program can only flag position where they are different from the given reference so if the given reference has yeah, has an allele that predisposes the reference guy to a disease, you will never see it in your genome. That is the caveat of using individuals as reference genome. If that person has a predisposition to say breast cancer and there is a mutation there and then when I am comparing my reference to that person, it is not going to reveal that I have that breast cancer mutation because I am not mutated. This is something that is very important for you to know. If I am not different from the reference, it will not say I am different. So if reference has a um, no pathogenic mutation, it will never call it on me. So that is the drawback of using a reference genome that belongs to an individual. Not using a reference genome that is either the God's genome or the perfect man or whatever. We don't have such a person. So we can do that. So most reference genomes are from individuals and this is the caveat. We do need to keep in mind. Okay. I think I am going to have to end this position. Then they just with few because I started 5 minutes late. I am going to just take few more minutes just to hammer on the heterozygous. How do you, how do you know something is heterozygous? This slide if you remember. These are all the blues and pinks are reads mapped to the genome. And on the top the yellow is an exon. Okay. So then do the vertical line that you are seeing here, this vertical line, this vertical line that you, that you are seeing are mutations in that position corresponding to the exon. Okay, so that's what I said. I am going to, I gave you some example of what is the heterozygous mutation will look like. See every read doesn't have a mutation. What does it mean? The other read that doesn't have a mutation has a, the same allele as the reference genome. So this could be a heterozygous mutation okay in this also there is heterozygous this is a heterozygous mutation but both the heterozygous like a G and a A are not there in the reference in the previous one one arm of uh, one of, um, of the individual has a A and the other arm has a reference allele okay in the next one the example was both arm of the, it is heterozygous again, but both arm does not have the reference allele. It has a G or a A which is not the reference arm. That's why it is calling. Otherwise, it won't be able to call. And then we saw an example again of a heterozygous reference in this. And then we saw how a variant is calling completely homozygous. This is what we were hammering and you put a one that you understand. Both this G and A in this slide are homozygous alternate. Means that the person has gotten a A from both the mother and the father. Getting it? I know we talked about this slide and we also said whether it is changing amino acid or not. I'm not going to go, go do that which we have already done. But I'm re-emphasizing what I showed at that time. Correct? Okay. So, now... You have sequenced, suppose you have sequenced 100 individuals, 50 from area A, 50 from area B, then what are you going to do? You want to find out how many are common, how many variants are common between the two population, how many variants are unique between the two population and you want to say what are all the position varying across the population. Okay, you're going to do all that. And because it's a hands-on kind of course, I'm using a word, word arithmetic, there are tools which which I think in the next few days you can try it. You can do two 
um, two individuals you can call variants using the same reference. These arithmetic will only work if you exactly use the same assembly and the same reference. You cannot map call variants for one person using a G18 and the other person using a G19. You cannot do this arithmetic. It will be meaningless. So if you have used a G19 as your reference for all the individuals, then you can say, okay, bed tools, there are intersect option in bed tools. You can use VCF tools. By now, you, you should be very familiar with how to go and find tools and find the option. And you should be familiar with command line by now. So if I give you two VCF file, you should be able to say, hey, 80% of the variants are common between them. For example, um, my, I did the exome sequencing for myself and my brother. 67% of the variants were common between us. Rest of them could be somatic mutation. Rest of them maybe, you know, I might have gotten some mother some where he's getting only that from the father some and mix up could have happened. Okay, so when I did the same thing with myself and my sister-in-laws, there was only 37% of the variant that were intersecting. Okay, so things like that, you can ask questions. That tells you already that me and my brother are related, me and my sister-in-law are not related. So already you see it by simple intersect, intersect thing, you can tell who is related and who is not. Right? And variants unique to two individuals, you can subtract. You say that, okay, from my brother's variants, subtract my variants. I want to know what, what is unique about him because he has some disease that, that I don't have. Or I have some disease that he doesn't have. I want to see. I'm going to use my brother as a normal to see why I'm getting asthma. Why am I getting this disease? And stuff like that. You can subtract. That also you can do using bed tools and VCF tools. Okay. And then you can merge. You can take my brother, mine, my siblings, uh, my parents, my everything to get a big um, set of variants that we all have. You know, this is my family variation list. You can merge them. You can say 100% of my family has this variant. And I can say, okay, 90% of my family has this variant. So you can do a merge tool. Again, merge tool, you can use these tools. There may be other tools. There are also BCF tools, whatever. There are too many tools, okay? So use them. So whatever question you are asking, you use that. That arithmetic is something that you can do in the last few days of this um, summer camp. I'm calling it a summer camp, right? Okay. And from I'm going to adjourn here. And what we will what we will learn in the next class, which is a little bit um, uh, conceptually a little bit complex, but we are using individual genomes as reference. Like in human, we are using one person genome as reference. Not all positions are pathogenic immediately. How do you correct for it? Okay. How do you go on with that? And second thing we will do in the next lecture, we'll talk about somatic mutation. How do people find cancer-specific mutation? Mm, how can you narrow down and say that, aha, these mutations are the one uh, that this person has, which is causing cancer, and hence, drug A may not work and drug B may work, which is a very important application in cancer. Because people don't have time to try different, like if I have a headache today, I can try aspirin, Tylenol, this, that, I have time. But cancer people, people who are struggling with late stage cancer, they don't have time to play around with drugs that won't do any good to them. On top of that, they will have side effect. They have to struggle. So this kind of genetic based, um, individualized, personalized care, what they call it, can help say, okay, okay, this drug won't work. Merck drug, Merck drug won't work, only Novartis drug will work for this person. You can do that. So it is the biggest application in, uh, application in cancer. Other application is in, in neonatal. Screening kids uh, when they are still uh, in the fetal stage to see whether they have any genetic disorder. Screening them at the embryonic stage. So those are big applications in human of um, this variant calling and everything. So I think you are getting getting some idea of how to do it, what it means, and your situation in your project, things can be different, but I think you know enough concept to know, yeah, this is how I'm going to find it. I have a unique problem, and this is the strategy I'm going to use to find, my, find the variants.
Okay, with this, I think you, can, you guys can type in question. I'm going to wait for a few more minutes if some someone has questions. I know last time Himani had some weekend or okay. Nobody has questions. Someone has okay. I don't see any questions from you. I hope you guys enjoyed the whole thing about the germline mutation and read a lot. Um, there are a lot of um, you know. Uh, terminologies I dropped in you can do your own research and learn and uh, what I'm going to do before I sh shut off I'm going to send you that link link for that paper I think I might have sent it on the whatsapp already but if I didn't I will send that link I read that paper and that's all folks for today we'll meet again tomorrow at nine o'clock uh, pacific daylight saving time bye